Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. We bring together patients, experts, and health advocates who are all here to help you optimize your health. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gawlin. Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. Today we're kicking off our EOE FAQ mini series where we tackle the most common questions about eosinophilic esophagitis or EOE. In the first episode, we're addressing a question that confuses many, is EOE a food allergy? And to help us answer this, we're thrilled to welcome back the brilliant Dr. Pooja Singhal. Dr. Singhal is a board-certified gastroenterologist, hepatologist, and obesity medicine specialist. She's also the founder of the Oklahoma Gastro Health and Wellness Center, where she's committed to providing comprehensive care to patients dealing with complex gastrointestinal conditions. This episode is brought to you by Sanofi Regeneron. And as always, friends, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and write a review for the podcast and the podcast episodes. Thank you so much. Dr. Singhal, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jackie. It's such a pleasure and always a treat to be back because I so enjoy our conversations about very relevant topics. And thank you for that question. That's such a, such a common question and a source of confusion and misinformation. EOE, which is eosinophilic esophagitis, and Food allergies have an association. They're linked, but they're a very distinct entity. Um, So a food allergy is not same as EOE is not a food allergy per se. So Dr. Singhal, if EOE isn't a food allergy in the traditional sense, what role does food play in triggering EOE? Absolutely. Um, So eosinophilic esophagitis is a chronic immune-mediated delayed reaction that's kind of triggered and um, the pathophysiology with it is that the T helper cells basically trigger eosinophils, which is a type of cell that we all have. But when you have allergic triggering due to foods or due to environmental triggers, um, that's when it causes eosinophils to deposit in the esophagus, which is our food pipe. And it's a localized reaction. So it's very specific to the esophagus, hence the name eosinophilic esophagitis. But the food allergies, traditionally that we think about food allergy, that's more mediated by IgE. And IgE-mediated reactions um, are imagey. They are not delayed. They are imagey hypersensitive reactions, and they're not localized to just esophagus. They can be systemic. So, you know, you can get the hives. Traditionally, when we think about allergies, we think about hives breaking out, you know, shortness of breath, and not being able to um, kind of have like a more systemic reaction as opposed to in eosinophilic esophagitis, it's a chronic immune-mediated reaction and it's very specific to esophagus. So people may feel difficulty swallowing, they may, may feel reflux, they may feel chest discomfort. So a big distinction in those two entities. So that's One thing that I really want to make sure is that we appreciate the differences between those two things. Now, the link here is that the common food that can trigger eosinophilic esophagitis are milk, wheat, soy, seafood, nuts. Those are fish. Those are kind of our big uh, five to six foods that are commonly associated with as associated and identified as triggers for eosinophilic esophagitis. So the symptoms, so this is a great point. So when we think of a sy- systemic allergic reaction, if someone eats peanuts or shellfish, they may get hives, they may have trouble breathing in the worst case scenario, they have to use the EpiPen. With EO- EOE, it's very localized to the esophagus, and that's when a patient, depending on what stage, right, we talked about this in your earlier um, episodes, depending on what stage the esophagus is at in, you know, whether it's stricturing or, or it's like really there's food impaction, there may be other signs um, that have to do with trouble swallowing. Um, and so this is 
when someone eats the food that you just mentioned or a food that's known to trigger that, this is what's going to happen to them. It's going to be right in the esophagus, correct? That's correct. But or the, the chest area. Exactly. But the big distinction is people tend to realize the true food allergies right away because they will have systemic reactions that are quite scary and immediate. So, for example, people who are allergic to tomatoes or seafood like shrimp, some of the common things they will like eat that particular food and then break out. Or like you said, even more scary, systemic reaction is trouble breathing or the feeling of throat closing. And you can associate and link, hey, I ate something and I had this kind of reaction. So it's a little easier to identify. And people tend to be like, okay, I'm not going to eat that food again, which they should not. Um, those are, and those food allergies are usually then tested by an allergist, immunologist, by a skin prick. Whereas with eosinophilic esophagitis, because it's so chronic and slow, there's not typically an immediate reaction. So a lot of times this disease can go undiagnosed. One, because it's slowly manifesting and slowly leading to symptoms. And two, because it can present and mimic some of the very common symptoms like reflux or chest discomfort or clearing of throat. When people start having difficulty swallowing or food impactions, that's when they tend to seek further evaluation. But sometimes even then people are like, oh, food just got stuck because I ate too fa fast or I've had reflux. So there's a delay in diagnosis with EOE. And that's very important to recognize the difference in presentation. I'm so glad you, you emphasize this because what we, wh why we do what we do and we have these podcast episodes and we focus on EOE is that there is this delay in diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And Patients are smart. We're very attuned to our bodies. We may realize that, oh my God, every time I eat chicken, it gets stuck in my throat. So I'm going to avoid chicken. Yes. But just avoiding the food when it's not a true allergy. Yes. Because EOE, as you've said over and over again, is a progressive disease. Yes. Please tell our listeners why it's important and when the signs and symptoms are there what what patients need to be aware of and when to seek help or to absolutely, go to the doctor absolutely and i feel like we we keep coming back to this topic because the incidence and prevalence is simply increasing over the last 30 years i mean our incidence has gone from like what is eoe nobody has heard about it it's a new medical disease an entity that we're kind of curious about to hey you know every I feel like one in 20%, 20 people who seek care for difficulty swallowing um, or reflux, at least with my population, and it's a biased population because I'm a gastroenterologist, I diagnose eosinophilic esophagitis. So number one, it's getting more common. Number two, it is a progressive disease that can lead to stricturing, which, you know, our esophagus is like a tube. It is a very incredible tube that does peristalsis, which is movement, and it helps move the food down our pipe so it can go in the stomach. Now, when there is eosinophils, these cells that are deposited in this tube, it affects the squeeze function of the esophagus. It affects the opening of the esophagus because it can get narrow and it, that's called stricturing and fibrosis. And we don't want to, we don't want that because the structurally, when the integrity of our organ is changed, then that requires multiple repetitive treatments, whether it is dilations or uh, worse yet, if it's progressive and can affect the motility, the way it moves, that is very, very hard then to treat. And it is such an easy disease to diagnose and manage that we all should seek early care and early answers if you're having you know, if you're having persistent choking on foods and um, persistent reflux symptoms despite the basic treatment. So can we reemphasize for patients, um, how can they know that it's not an, just an allergy to food, that it's something more? And what advice do you have for these patients 
who should they go see first um, yeah, to get the proper diagnosis? Absolutely. So, you know, in adult population, the symptoms are people who are having a lot of reflux and now the med- you know the medications that have been prescribed by the primary provider are not controlling it um, so we refer to that as refractory those patients should absolutely have further evaluation and see a specialist a gastroenterologist because eosinophilic esophagitis can be diagnosed during an EGD which is an upper endoscopy you're asleep it's about a 10-minute procedure where a skilled, uh, trained physician is taking a tube and looking when you're asleep uh, to look if we see signs of eosinophilic esophagitis and we are taking tissue samples. So it's pretty painless. You don't feel any pain. Um, the other symptoms would be recurrent food impactions, like food getting stuck in the chest, that feeling, and especially solid foods like breads, rice, chicken, um, that always requires further workup and not to be taken lightly. So if you're having that, uh, those symptoms where you're like, hey, I had a panic or I really felt like something was stuck, those are definitely two of the main, main symptoms where I would definitely recommend for seeking care. And in children, these symptoms are different. Any, but any child that's being very, very picky in uh, food eating, not gaining weight, um, uh, having nausea, tummy ache, we need to think about that. This as a, as a possible cause of that, food avoidance. Well, thank you. And we have several episodes that address not only the adult uh, presentation of EOE, we also have pediatric um, insights from our co- your colleague at the Cleveland Clinic, um, Dr. Patel. Um, but thank you, Dr. Singal, for shedding light on this important topic. If you want to hear more about EOE, you can listen to Dr. Singal's previous episodes, as well as our whole playlist on EOE that dives deeper into the topic of diagnosis, treatment options and symptoms and stay tuned for our next episode in the EOE FAQ series where we're going to explore treatments for EOE including PPIs, steroids and biologics. So thank you very much and don't forget to like, subscribe and share this episode uh, on the Gastro Girl uh, channels. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.